Good? Yeah. Glad you're here? Yeah. Good. Good. So I'm going to go to a few different places in the Bible here. And um, I'm not going to land in any one place. And what I want to talk about is the reality that we are in a crisis. This globe is in a crisis. Our nation is in a crisis. And one of the biggest crises that we have is real men, the lack of real men. And so James said, hey, uh, why don't you bring a message to the men's conference? And I'm thinking, you know, I'm so used to doing prophecy messages in conferences or with our own church, uh, going through a book. Um, and I thought, okay, what, what is it with the men that uh, God has a message for? So about a month ago, I was talking with one of my friends in ministry. He's another pastor. He's back in Minnesota. And he has a book that's being published in about two more weeks. And he said, hey, can you write the foreword for it or the thing for the front of the book or whatever? And I said, sure. So we're talking a little bit. Of, and then he sent it to me to read. And I read it. And I said, man, this book is great. I'm speaking for James Cadiz at a men's conference. I wanna, I wanna, I'm going to rip you off. But I, I, I ripped off the ideas. I told him, I'm not going to rip off the book, but the ideas are so good behind it. It's your book. The, the, his, his name is Mark Henry. His book is called The Man Code. And uh, I would Google it in about two weeks. You're going to be absolutely blessed. So what I did is I uh, just took the idea that he had from it. It was very inspiring for me. Um, this isn't the book, but it uh, inspired me. And he gave some different points on what real men are. And I took some of those points and I I put them into content for us today, uh, for where we are. Uh, And um, and man, we need help. And so this is going to be a little bit of a challenge for us as men. And I'm certain that there will be a little bit of Uh, I'm not quite at that level yet. Or I see where my problem is. And praise God that you're going to help me. You don't leave us in the ditch. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. I thank you for the message from Dale and what you're going to do here the rest of the day. I thank you for my brother James. What a dear friend. I thank you for giving me a brother that we can walk in this life together, press forward together, encouraging one another until we are called home. I lift up all of the men in here and anybody who will listen to this message later or this conference later, strengthen us that we would be a difference in our world. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. John Wayne said, a man's got to have a code, a creed to live by, no matter his job. I love that. we got to have a code. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, here's a code for us. Verse 13, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. So we look at what's going on in the world right now, and it's, uh, it, 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 there's that temptation to not be strong, to not raise up to the different tasks that we have that we know that we are supposed to apply ourselves to as men. We listen to the media, and you don't know if a boy is a girl or a girl is a boy, and all the other crazy stuff that's out there. Men have been demasculized, humiliated, mocked, ridiculed, and has had devastating effects. Here's just one example. On average, in the United States, we have had one school shooting per week since Sandy Hook in December of 2012. We've had one school shooting per week. I already said that, didn't I? Did I already say that? Where am I? Whoa, okay. <laughs> I got to get my head screwed on straight again. 
Males perpetrated almost all of the school shootings. Some see gun control as a solution, but at best that would be a band-aid. It does not address the deeper issue. Guns are not new, but pervasive numbers of school shootings are new. So what changed? Specifically, it's what changed for boys. Many blame school shootings on problems in mental health, but that begs another question. Why is there a mental health crisis in the United States? And in other first world countries, according to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, in 2018, 20% of American adults have been diagnosed with some form of mental illness. That's one in five. Don't forget how far we have lowered the bar in this area. We now consider it healthy for a normal, normal or healthy or normal for a boy to think he is a girl and vice versa. And we don't have this standard up here anymore. The problem is we don't have this standard. We don't have this standard in the church, let alone out there in the rest of the world. Society answers by addressing the symptoms or by lowering the standards of what it calls normal. Even before the COVID pandemic, the United States was spending almost 18% of its entire gross domestic product on health care. Uh, for decades, we spent wildly to cure diseases, make better medicines, build a better healthcare infrastructure, and create better health technology. You'd expect this massive amount of money and this many medical advances to pay off in longer lives. But in 2015, life expectancy for Americans began decreasing. Now, why did life expectancy for Americans start decreasing five years before COVID? The answer can be described in an academic of despair. The CDC blames the decline on the rise in drug overdoses and an ever-growing number of suicides. Suicides is despair on steroids. Americans, especially men and boys, are dying younger because hopelessness and despair are killing them. Before age nine, girls and boys commit suicide about the same low rate. But between the ages of 10 and 14, twice as many boys as girls commit suicide. Then it gets worse. Between the ages of 15 and 19, four times as many boys kill themselves than girls. Between the ages of 20 and 24, that number jumps to six times. America needs men. I look at my own son. My son is 19 years old. When I was going to high school, there was a song, I think it was by Brownsville Station, called Smoking in the Boys' Room. I don't know if any, any of you guys are old enough to remember that, a few of you. Smoking in the Boys' Room. That was the hard thing when I went to school. Guys smoking in the boys' room. Smoking cigarettes. Now it's suicide. We got transgender stuff. I have a 19-year-old son growing up in this world, and when I was driving here this morning, I could not help but think how difficult it must be for a parent right now trying to raise up a child that's young. You're looking at a 5-year-old, you're looking at a 6-year-old, you're looking at a 10-year-old. Our daughter is a junior in high school, and you look at young kids thinking if you have a a mind of Christ, and you're thinking, I want to do what's right, or you just have any righteousness in your brain at all. It's a horror story when you start to play this thing out, and you think, this is why our kids are killing themselves. And there's an epidemic of despair, I believe, because an epidemic of a problem with real men, and an epidemic of a problem with real men who don't love God and don't know how to pursue God. So into this crisis, or as this states, stand strong in the storm, I'm going to give you five things that we need for, to be real men. You ready? First one is this. These five things that speak to this, because there's so few real men in this world. Number one is this, real men pursue biblical success. In Joshua chapter 1, the Bible says, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. 
This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. So how do we define success? Joshua says, don't turn to the left, don't turn to the right. That's what God says through Joshua. You stay the course. You meditate in this book. Then you will have success. So how do we define success? We define it by our business accomplishments, uh, getting, uh, accomplishing our goals. Uh, some are going to define it by fame. Uh, others are going to define it by uh, whether or not they have success in traveling around the world or whatever it may be. But how does God define success? From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is a book about Jesus Christ. A biblical success means realizing the ambition to please God through Jesus Christ. It's pleasing God. That's biblical success. 2 Corinthians chapter, two, uh, chapter 5 verse 9 says, Therefore also we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. In the Bible, the Bible gives us various people who did not please God. Some were wealthy, some were highly educated, some even led nations. Many of them stood at the pinnacle of human achievement. Still, they did not please God. Some were kings at the pinnacle of the success of this world. Others were Pharisees at the pinnacle of the success of religion. They actually viewed themselves as being right with God because they knew this. But the problem was they had a really bad interpretation of this, which led to a bad application of this, and they reached the place of the pinnacle success of religion. Pharaoh was very successful by the world's standards. Nero was successful by the world's standards. Caiaphas was the high priest that was very successful by the religious standards. Yet he's the one that made sure that Jesus was crucified. The apostle Paul thought he was successful in his religion. He read the Bible, the Old Testament. He knew it better than almost anybody. He could probably quote anything you wanted just from his memory. But he did not know Christ. He was far from God. He followed all of the right religious rules. If there was a church, he went to church all the time. If there were Bible studies, he went to Bible studies all the time. He taught the Bible studies. He taught the teachers. He stood up in the pulpits. He would have been that guy and everybody would have followed him. They would have read all of his books and all of that stuff. And Paul says, I counted as rubbish. It is dung before the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Going to church doesn't make you a real man. Staying home from church doesn't make you a real man. It is knowing Christ. It is seeking to please him. God never tells us to be successful, but he does tell us to be faithful. True success is in our pursuit of being pleasing to him and pursuing to be faithful to him. God did not call us to be successful. He called us to be faithful to him. I don't care if it's religious success or business success. Ask James. How many pastors there are right now that are all over the globe that are preaching anything but Jesus Christ as being the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father except by me. How many of them are out there preaching? Kumbaya. Let's just all do a group, big group hug and... Um, Listen, we're all going to go to heaven. Think on this. David did amazing things in his life. David in the Old Testament, right? He did amazing things in his life. God had radically blessed him. David, in the, from the business standard, the king standard, the leader standard, was phenomenal. You couldn't be much more successful than David was. And you want to know something else? David not only had tremendous successes, David also had tremendous failures. In fact, if you, if you zero in on parts of David's life, you would say David was an incredible failure. Here's what's interesting. God didn't say, David, this is awesome. You are successful. 
And regarding his failures, God didn't say, David, I'm writing you off. You are a failure. And I praise God because he knows that we are all men. And we have our successes and we have our failures. This is what God said. Instead of saying, David, you're successful or David, you're a failure. God said that David was a man after his own heart. Apart from the successes and apart from his failures. According to God, David was a man that sought to please him. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. What is the measure of success? Therefore, also we have as our ambition, whether at home or at present, to be pleasing to God. So number one, real men pursue biblical uh, success. Number two, real men possess focus. Bruce Lee, I'm guessing most of you heard of Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee said, the successful warrior is the average man with laser-like focus. Did you catch that? The successful warrior is the average man, that'd be us, with laser-like focus. Uh, men face distractions and diversions on every side. For biblical success, we need focus, and this means we need to live with intention. And the Bible tells us to set your mind on things above, Colossians chapter 3, not on the things of the earth. Let me illustrate how this works, and I'm going to use the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Just a few verses from Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. So Nehemiah, in a nutshell, he uh, works for the king. He's the cupbearer. So the cupbearer is the guy who would test the food and to, to make sure it's edible for the king that he doesn't get poisoned. So the cupbearer would eat the food. If he dies, then the king doesn't eat it. I mean, what a job to have. The cupbearer was lower than the butler. Now, one of my friends says he was four times lower than the butler. That's pretty bad. That's the guy you're looking at thinking, if, he's, yeah, if he just gets knocked off today, that's okay. So Nehemiah is the cupbearer. But yet God gave him favor with the king. Nehemiah gets word that Jerusalem was in shambles and the people weren't able to worship. Nehemiah recognizes he needs to build this wall around the city of Jerusalem so that the people can worship again. So God gives him favor with the king. He goes before the king. The king says, yeah, Nehemiah, I'm going to let you go to uh, see your city and to build the wall. That's it in a nutshell. Nehemiah gets papers from the king eventually. He gets everything he needs. And he goes to Jerusalem to build the wall. They start building the wall. They have all kinds of problems. So let's walk through this, all right? Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, when I was in Susa, the capital, the Hanani, one of my brothers and some of the men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. And when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for several days. So all of this stuff is going on. Jerusalem is a mess. Nehemiah is just this low-life cupbearer by the world's standards. But he raises up to the, the, the opportunity because he realizes, listen, I love God. And the people need to worship and I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm not going to be part of the problem. I'm not just going to sit there on the sidelines. Listen, God never tells us to sit on the sidelines, ever. When the Apostle Paul likened the Christian life, he liked it to the, the Christian running a race like the Olympics. Let's say you're doing a 400-meter run or something like that, which, which I could never do. I would be exhausted. But let's just say you're doing that. The Apostle Paul likened the Christian race to that. What happens when the, when, when the person running the race sees the finish line? They're supposed to run as if they're going to get first prize. You look at the Olympics, only one person is getting the gold. The Apostle Paul says, you run as if you're going to get to the, the prize. What do all the runners do? They're all running their heart out, hoping they're going to catch the fastest guy out there or be the fastest one out there, right? None of them pull up a chair and sit down. Listen, the, in fact, when you see them running the race, 
They're running at pretty much the same speed, all of them. They get down towards the end. They, 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 they round the last turn. What do they do? There's the finish line. They are going all out as fast and as hard as they can. They are giving it everything in their body. They have trained for years for this one moment. They see the finish line, and they are going for it with everything they got. They don't see the finish line and go, ah, let me pull up a chair and watch my friends go by. Nehemiah, he's a cupbearer. He's a nobody in the king's kingdom. What does he do? He's like the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. He says, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to step up to the plate. Here I am. Send me. I will go build that wall. I have enough brains. I've got construction experience. I'm not going to put up with this stuff from the enemy. We are going to go for it. So he does. He gets the green light from the king. The king sends him. He goes back to Jerusalem. They start building the wall. You want to know what happens when they start building the wall? The attacks come. Let me give you three lines of the enemy's attacks. You want to know what the first one was? They're going to build the wall. They start building the wall. The first attack, first line of enemy attack, it was mockery. They mocked and they threatened these feeble Jews. This is what they said, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 3. If a fox should jump on the wall, he would break their stone wall down. That stone wall can't handle even a fox laughing at the Jews. What are you foolish Jews doing? Here's a lesson. When you have ambition to do the will of God, Satan will send someone or even millions of someones to mock you. Mocking is a tried and true way to make men passive, to make them disengage, to get them to cease and desist. Ask Pastor James. Let me tell you, the mocking that takes place is from usually people that are just jealous. That's what's going on in the days of Nehemiah. They didn't want these Jews building the wall. Hey, wait a minute. These, what? 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 They start to mock them. They laugh them. That happens to you too. I was telling my son uh, just last night. Um, I said, listen, you're always trying to push forward with success. People don't like anybody that pushes forward. They're going to pull you down. I remember hearing years ago, I think it was when I was in high school, about a bunch of monkeys that were put into this big, great big cylinder. And as soon as, and, and as, soon as one of them started figuring out how to climb to the top and get out, the other ones would pull it back down. That's how we operate as human beings. That's how they did it in Nehemiah's day. They started to mock them. Uh, to, get, to make them passive. There's a whole lot of passive men right now who disengage, who don't press towards the finish line. When you are pressing forward for the kingdom of Christ, whether church, home, family, work, or whatever it may be, Satan's thugs will come mocking. What did Nehemiah do when the mockers came? He prayed that God would hear their mocking, and he did what Bruce Lee learned to do said to do, stayed laser focused. This is what he did. Nehemiah chapter four, verse six, they mocked us, but what did we do? We built the wall and the whole wall was joined together to half its height for the people had a mind to work. We, we, they're mocking God, you take care of the mockers. You take care of the scoffers. When I think of the last days, the Bible tells us in the last days, scoffers will come say, where's the promise of this coming? Don't talk about this foolish stuff. Let me tell you, People don't want to hear that Jesus is coming, even people that were formerly in the church. And they will mock and they will ridicule. If you're trying to be a real man and you're married, even your wife might ridicule you. You press forward with what you know is biblically the right thing to do. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So the first line of enemy attack is mockery. Second line of enemy attack was to induce fear. Induce fear in Nehemiah. Induce fear in the people. As the enemies of God saw the progress, they started to muster an army and threatened to attack and kill Nehemiah and his leaders. Even under the threat of war, Nehemiah refused to be distracted. Instead, he prayed and he challenged the people. Chapter 4, verse 14, when I saw their fear, the people's fear, they're afraid, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord 
who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And then he told them to get a weapon, in verse 17, those who were rebuilding the wall and those who had carried the burdens took their load with one hand doing the work, and the other hand they held a weapon, which we're going to get to weapons in just a minute too, since this is a men's conference, and it is a Bible men's conference. What happens, they, were, they had this fear, Nehemiah says, listen, we're going to press forward. You're going to work and you're going to have a weapon. You're going to be ready to go. The Bible tells us, as Nehemiah stayed laser focused and prayed to God and challenged the people, don't be afraid. Right now, I would say, in this generation that we are alive, don't be afraid because there's a whole lot of mocking that's going on out there right now if you're standing strong. And there's a whole lot of fear mongering that's coming not just from Dr. Fauci and Bill Gates and those cronies, but from the other churches. I can't believe you're opening. Oh, you're going to kill everybody. You're a super spreader. We're going to report you to the authorities. Report us. We have the authority. We have the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are standing strong on him, and we're going to press forward. We don't let the... Amen. Third, so God melts the hearts of the enemies. Nehemiah stayed focused in the building, continued. Third line of enemy attack was personal assassination. Assassination. As the walls neared completion, the enemies of God tried another approach. Plotting an assassination, they invited Nehemiah to meet him. They said they only wanted a conversation that would lead to peace. You, you can hear him. Come on, Nehemiah, let's just have a cup of coffee. Come on, Nehemiah, let's have some of that good Turkish coffee. You know that stuff. Maybe get some donuts or something like that. Let's just have a peace agreement. They wanted to meet with him so they could kill him. we got to kill this guy. Nehemiah was not a stupid person. Nehemiah's response was priceless. They wanted to meet with him. He knew what was going on. He sent messengers, and this is what he says. I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. Should have added to you losers. Wouldn't that be great if that was in there? Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? I'm doing a great work for the king. You want me to come down and have a cup of coffee with you guys? Not going to happen. I know what your intent is. I know what you've said about me. I know what you've said about all of us Jewish people. I know that you have mocked us. I know that you have threatened us. And now you just want to meet and be good. No. No. They sent similar messages to Nehemiah four times. Come on, come on. But each time he answered the same way. Nehemiah had a vision and he stayed focused. He refused to be distracted or diverted. He focused on the task that God laid out for him. Under his leadership, the Jews finished the wall in just 52 days. That is remarkable because of all the persecution, all the challenges, all the fear mongering, all the mockery, 52 days. Think of this. The Jews had failed at the task for 50 years. But when a man rose up who was considered a nobody, less than a butler, a cupbearer, he rose up, he said, let's go. <laughs> 52 days. 50 years of nothingness until a man stood up. It just takes one man that wants to be a real man that can stay focused. Sometimes we can be good at starting, but not finishing. God doesn't want us to just start things. He wants us to finish things. I'm great at starting things. It's really easy to start. But learning to finish, and finish well, that's what God would want us to do. Number three. So number one, biblical success. Real men pursue biblical success. Number two, Real men are laser focused. Number three, real men pursue godly character. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 1 says, A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. Abraham Lincoln said, I would rather be a little nobody than an evil somebody. Amen. 
Because there's a whole lot of evil somebodies that are running everything right now. Let me repeat that again. I would rather be a little nobody, which Nehemiah was. I'd rather be a little nobody than an evil somebody. And to develop godly character, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 says, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Let me, let me work that out with you for a minute. In Hebrew, the word used for vision Where there's no vision, the people are unrestrained. The word used for vision is the kind of vision received by the prophet that is written into this book. Therefore, when you put it into context, without God's word, the people cast off restraint. Let me repeat that again. Literally, what it's referring to, without God's word, the people cast off restraint. This is restraining people right now from all sorts of evil by the power of the Holy Spirit working through real men. The restrainer is going to be gone. Can you imagine what happens when the restraint is taken off this place? The rapture takes place? I mean, look at the evening news right now. The bad news that we hear is only going to continue. The only thing that could possibly stop everything from going from bad to even worse, is the possibility that there would be a remarkable spiritual awakening. But personally, let me tell you something. Personally, I have friends that believe it's going to happen. I don't see that happening. Um, Because I don't see churches going to the Word. What I see is the opposite has happening. Churches are going away from the Word. At a time, this is nuts to me, at a time when we need the Word more than ever, Pastors are saying, no, it's just too upsetting to too many people. No, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. No, we can't talk about sin. Don't you know boys are girls and girls are boys now in this culture that we're in? Without God's word, the people are unrestrained because they have no consistent measure of good and evil. Imagine this, you're a contractor. To you, 12 inches is 12 inches. To somebody else, no. No, 12 inches is 27 inches. What's going to happen? You hire a subcontractor. He sees 12, he's thinking, your buildings, what are you, this is what's happened. We have a a world that is, a, a church that is turned from the word of God that used to have some kind of good effect on the world around it And now we have a world that is unrestrained and can't measure good from evil, whether it's 24 inches or 27 inches or 2 inches or whatever it is. So everything is screwed up. You look at our country. You look at our schools. um, Schools are messed up. Yesterday I saw in the news there was a school in Los Angeles, school district, and it had, a teacher had put up in the classroom, I'm sure some of you saw it, a teacher had put up in the classroom, uh, F the police, um, all this different stuff like that, Uh, black lives matter, um, white people, all white people are racist, this kind of stuff, right? This is in the, this is in a classroom. Uh, we had that teacher, I think it was in Newport Mesa School District just a couple of weeks ago that uh, went on her, all these bizarre rampages, uh, giving allegiance to the gay flag instead of the, the, the American flag. And she, I'm sure some of you guys saw that. I know James played that thing everywhere. You, you see that. Um, and then at the gala, uh, the Met Gala last, uh, just a few days ago, that Rapino person, the, the soccer player, I can't remember her name. Megan, Megan Rapino. Yeah. So instead of in God we trust, she has on something she's got, her purse or something like that, in gay we trust. So it's like waking up to realize what is really going on. I mean, there are people like Bill Maher, who's been well known to be a radical left atheist God-hater, Christian-hater, who is now calling out the other side, saying, look, 
what is the matter with you guys? This whole thing has gone mad. When you got a guy like Bill Maher that starts to call out the left and say, you've lost your minds? They haven't lost their minds. Their soul is lost. It has caused their minds to be greatly infected. We've been given over to a debased mind. That's why we see all this bizarre stuff happening. Romans chapter 1. When a people reach a place where they've so rejected the truth of God, they worship the creation rather than the creator, and men lie with men, and that's what they want to do. They turn them over. God says, I'll turn them over to a debased mind. Three different times God says, I'll turn them over. That's where we've landed in America. We've been turned over. We can look at media. We can look at schools. But to me, the most appalling thing is churches. And I'm sure you guys are here, so you're already connecting with that. I mean, it's just, you look and you go, what kind, uh, it, it's, the people have cast off restraint. There is no prophetic vision, whether it's re- the first coming of Christ or the second coming of Christ. Don't tell us about this. Let us do what we want in gay we trust and the media and churches celebrate that stuff. I almost cursed. (laughs) It's true. So number one, real men pursue biblical success. They pursue that laser focus. Number uh, two, number three, they pursue godly character They have the prophetic vision of God's word that causes them not to cast off restraint but say, man, I want, I, I want, to, I want to live for God. But when a church is, don't teach this, we have a society like we got. Number four, real men protect others. Our society cringes at the biological reality of the differences between men and women. I had this conversation with somebody at our church recently. They just came up and they're asking a question. I said, seriously, about this. I said, seriously, do you not know that boys and girls have different parts? I mean, I was kind of like, are you stupid? Because there really is such a stupid argument. I mean, when these people say these things, look, I... You know, there's a lot of things I want to say right now, but I've got to be really careful because I don't want to offend too many of you. But I mean, seriously. Uh, and it, and it's, it is people have to be willfully denying what is true or they are just absolutely dumber than a rock or God has totally blinded them and given them so far over that no matter how many facts, no matter how much truth they see, they've been turned over. I mean, you look, you go, this is just idiotic. I have a son and a daughter. I have two dogs at home. Both of them are girl dogs. And you want to know what's interesting in this day and age when you got all this transgender stuff? Well, why don't you call boy dogs something? I mean, they're still a male or female, right? It hasn't infected the rest of creation. I mean, even plants, there's male and female plants. Why is it? Because it's an affront to the truth of God. God made them male and female. And God said, this is good. And anything God says is good, Satan hates. And anybody's mind that is not (coughs) affected by the truth of God's word, but it comes into a denial of this truth, is subject to having a mind that has been turned over to being absolutely tweaked. It won't even receive the truth. Know this, in the book of Revelation, it's not that the the people will know in the time of the tribulation, that God's judgment is happening, and they're going to know it's God judging them. They're going to absolutely know. They're going to know what the truth is. You have an angel that flies throughout the whole world, proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Um, there's another angel that says, do not receive the mark. And the people are going to know the judgments are coming upon them, but they will still refuse to repent. So they will absolutely know what the truth is. They will absolutely know it is of God, but they will, and they will know they're about ready to be sent to hell, and they'll still refuse to repent. And that's the society as you can see things developing right now in the mental state that people are in. It's a flat-out rejection of truth. So society cringes at the biological reality of the differences between men and women, and even with physical strength, right? It's obviously, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, God created men physically stronger than women for the most part. But you look, I mean, this is another thing with the transgender argument, right? I mean, you look at these, these transgender wrestlers. They go out there, there's a woman. Boom! They won the gold. Whoa, the first woman transgender. It's like, what is It's just madness. Where's the women's rights groups? I'm trying to figure that out. They don't care about the women in Afghanistan. And they're looking at what's going on in the transgender world. It's okay. It doesn't make sense. Because the reality of it is, even though... The world knows, the unsaved world knows, men are stronger than women. They cannot admit it because it's an admission of there is a God in heaven. And it's a huge problem. In the Bible, Psalm 82, verse 4, the cry is there from God or to God to rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. Real men protect others because real God protects others. And he expects us to step up to the plate. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, when judgment is threatened against the Jews, this is what God says. When judgment is threatened against the Jews, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. This is what the man is supposed to do. Defend the orphan, uh, plead for the widow, reprove the worthless, go after him. You, you deal with this stuff. Judgment is coming because you men aren't being men. And that describes where we are. Jeff Cooper in The Art of the Rifle wrote, <clears throat> The Rifle itself has no moral stature, since it has no will of its own. Naturally, it may be used by evil men for evil purposes, but there are more good men than evil, and while the latter cannot be persuaded to the path of righteousness by propaganda, they can certainly be corrected by good men with rifles. I like that. In the city where I live, Hemet, California, it was December of 2019. It was a couple of days after Christmas. It was a very awful tragedy that happened. Um, there was a fire that started in an apartment complex. It was, I think it was one or two in the morning, something like that. The family's mom woke up the dad. Dad's name was Juan Marino. He didn't hesitate. He helped his wife, their infant child, an 11-year-old daughter to safety. However, there were still three kids back in the apartment. So he helps them out. Then Juan goes back in to rescue the remaining children, a four-year-old daughter, Janessa, a 12-year-old daughter, and an eight-year-old son named Isaac. So Juan goes back in to rescue his other three kids. Juan was never seen alive again and the three kids that were in the fire also perished. Family members described Juan as a big kid at heart because he and his children loved to play together, but with everything on the line, Juan Marino um, became a real man. He gave his life trying to rescue his kids. So officials came around, and they used the occasion to warn people not to go into burning buildings to even to save loved ones. Nevertheless, the Hemet Police Lieutenant Nate Miller said, as a father myself, I think a lot of us would go back in. We're in a crisis situation. 
and we need to go in. We need to go all in. And we're out, there's, we protect others. There's different ways of protecting others. Um, James and I and Don, we have our ways of protecting others. But I was on a program, a radio program on Wednesday. I think it was called Fireline, and it's a Second Amendment program. And um, so I guess the guy watches us online, and he had some questions, and it was, it was a fun program to do. But he says, what about all these pastors and churches that are saying men are not supposed to protect their, Christians aren't supposed to be, uh, the, you, aren't, you shouldn't have any weapons for self-defense or anything. And I'm sure some of you guys have heard that. And I said, that's just absolute insanity. And I said, I said, I can promise you, at my house, if someone breaks into my house, and they're going to harm my wife or my children, even though my son's 19, I will do everything I can to eliminate them. Amen. And I said, I, I said, this is, you know, to have pastors teach this kind of stuff. What kind of pastor would let their wife be raped. Well, it's okay, bro, come on in. Just don't, just don't hurt, just don't, well, don't hurt me, but well, yeah, you can have my wife. I mean, what is this? Because they're afraid? I asked in the studio when I was doing the recording, because um, they said that this, the, the guy who was interviewing me said this thought has permeated our culture, and I asked the two guys that were with me, one was my son, 19. The other was uh, Gabe, who uh, uh, James knows is 22. And I said, you guys, what do you think about what I just said? Absolutely. I knew they were both kind of pro-Second Amendment guys. But he said it affected the younger culture. And I said, it, it may be. But it's really because men aren't being, the Christian men are not being the men they are supposed to be. We're in a world of soy boys. You know what those are? We're sissified. So number one, real men are biblically focused. Number two, are bib, uh, pursue biblical success. Number two, real men are razor focused. Number three, real men pursue godly character. Number four, real men actually protect others. There's physical protection, there's emotional protection, there's spiritual protection. Last one, number five, real men love the gospel and the church. Devotion to the church begins by loving the gospel, the good news of God's redemptive plan through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us, we are not to forsake the assembly, as I'm assuming you guys don't. We are not to forsake the assembly together, as some have done, but we are to encourage one another and inspire one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. I believe the world is in a crisis more than anything because pastors and men in church do not actually love the gospel nor the true church. I believe this is me and I realize this is my opinion but I do it based on what I've seen. It's like you examine the fruit, right? Jesus does tell us to be fruit inspectors. There's good fruit and bad fruit. And what I've seen happen is when people, pastors were told things were a little, 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 little tough, you better not meet anymore. They psh, scattered. And this is what I think the problem has been in America. Because you don't see this problem in, in China. You don't see this problem in these Muslim countries or in Africa where the church is meeting and pastors are raised up. They still meet, you know that? They have a thread of their life every week and they're meeting, every day if they're meeting. But in America, you have this huge problem. I believe personally the reason is 
is because the church, the fake church, not the real church, has become the pastor's church. It was not God's church. So what happens is it's real easy to make a decision, well, I'm going to close my church. Well, that's the problem. It's your church, not God's church. God never says, close my church. Did you you ever realize that in the Bible? He never says, close my church. But if it's going to threaten the money, if it's going to threaten the tithes, if it's going to threaten the income online or anything like that, oh, it can't upset the people. And the, I think the church, year, listen, years ago, I got two more minutes, right, James? <laughs> I'll just take two more minutes. So years ago, these studies started being sent out probably in the 1980s. I remember it very clearly from the 1990s. Um, surveys were sent out into neighborhoods where a church was going to plan a pastor to start a church. And they would send out the surveys and they would ask this question. What would you like in a church? They'd find out what the people liked and then they would send a pastor there and that's how they built the church. Around what the people liked. That's what the Bible warns about in the last days. Second Timothy chapter 4 where the, the people would raise up uh, leaders to, for their itching ears. Give them myths and fables not teaching them the truth. That's where we've landed. So after decades of doing that, we have, it's a pastor's church. We've developed something that people want. We want to keep the money flowing in, and blah, 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 blah. Brothers, we need to be about Christ. We need to pursue biblical success. We need to be razor-focused. We need to be about building our character, protecting others, and we need to be about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and loving his church the genuine, the genuine church, the real church and a fake church. And let us encourage one another as we see the day approaching. Lord, we thank you for your word. And I pray that you would bless the rest of this time today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. James is coming up.